truly my hope is in you. Watching on the video, I want you to know that this morning a monsoon hit Hilton Head. It was very windy and very rainy, and we are delighted to have as many people as we have, uh, in, including two from Miami, Florida, who came here just for this service. <laughs> That's not really true, but we're glad to have them here. At this time of year, many people have emotions that move to the fore as we anticipate once again the coming of another Christmas. Our thoughts turn to days long ago, to family members now far away. To the underlying excitement which comes from hearing Christmas carols and the familiar scripture passages, God injects himself into the increased pace of our activities as a baby born in a land far removed in every way from our own. And so, with Christmas confidence, let us worship God. New Testament readings are from Hebrews. starting with Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, and then 2, 9, 14 to 18. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. But we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him, who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. For surely it is not with angels that he is concerned, but with the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make expiation for the sins of the people, for because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted.
let me say, we are very privileged to have someone who can arrange a series of Christmas carols like that. Mm -hmm. Scott, we're very grateful to you. Patsy Bryson, Scott's wife, was to uh, be here as the liturgist, but she came back from South America with COVID. Um, um, so she's not here, and therefore, uh, Lois Miller was pressed into service as the liturgist, having been uh, out for at least five Sundays with illness herself. And uh, when she was pressed into service, it looked like she might be uh, the liturgist for four people, uh, including herself. So um, considering the weather, I am, I am simply thrilled with um, uh, as many people as are here. And uh, um, if anybody gets rewards in heaven, which is a, a, a dubious idea, but if they do, uh, you'll get your reward in heaven for being here today. Uh, you braved the elements and we're very grateful. Let us all pray. <clears throat> we thank Thee, O Lord our God, for bringing us once again to this season of the year where we are reminded anew of Thy love for us in sending one to us who is like us in many respects, and very unlike us in other respects. We thank Thee for the courage and audacity of Jesus, for His insight and wisdom and inner maturity. We praise Thee for instilling in Him a knowledge of Thee and Thy kingdom, which none of us could ever attain, hard as we might try. Teach us in this Christmas season how better to understand Thee by better understanding Him and His mission in the world. We thank Thee for people of faith through the ages who have been our guides and mentors in our own faith. We remember many of Thy famous saints of yore who have been pioneers, leading millions into Thy kingdom. And we also recall those ordinary people in our own personal lives who have been instrumental in leading us toward more faithful living. Parents, grandparents, teachers, pastors, those we long admired and attempted to emulate. May the community of Christmas spread its warmth and good cheer to those who feel lost or left out, especially to those who are living in war zones or in places of deep political unrest. We pray for those who face these holidays with new burdens, the unemployed, the underemployed, those who are newly and seriously ill, those whose futures have become very cloudy because of unanticipated obstacles, and those for whom pain has become the largest reality in their lives. As we pray for others who have great needs, we thank Thee for the relatively blissful existence which most of us have. Keep us from taking any of our blessings for granted and enable us to see continually that all good comes from Thee. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, the coming one, and the Messiah in whom we have come to know Thee most clearly. Now we join together in prayer as he taught his original disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading is from Hebrews 4, 11 through 16. Let us therefore strive to enter the rest 
that no one fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The text for the sermon comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. This is the fourth in a series of question a series of sermons asking the question, Who is Jesus? And the focus for today is the great high priest. In these sermons about the identity of Jesus, we come today to one of the most unusual books in the entire Bible, the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews was written by an unnamed Jew to a group of unnamed Jews. In the first century of the common era, almost all of the first Christians were Jewish Christians. They had come to believe that Jesus was the promised one of God, the Messiah. The writer of the letter says that indeed is who he was, who he is, and who he always shall be. But more than that, Jesus is also, said the writer, the great high priest. Since Protestants don't have priests, let alone high priests or great high priests, what does that expression mean? In Latin, the word for priest is pontifex. It comes from two roots, pons, which means bridge, and the verb facere, which means to build or make. Thus, a pontifex is a bridge builder. The pope is the pontifex maximus, the great high priest. And from what does the bridge builder, from what to what does he build his bridges? From us to God. We cannot do it ourselves, so Jesus does it for us. In the Bible, we're told that the Israelites had priests who offered sacrifices on their behalf. Every male from the tribe of Levi was automatically a priest. To this day, any Jew whose name is Levi or Levin or Lewin or any similar name is probably descended from the original tribe of Levi. In Hebrew, the word for priest is Kohen. So anyone named Kohen or Kohn or Kahana was also a priest, although not necessarily a Levite. All Levites were priests, but not all priests were Levites. If you don't understand this, don't worry. It doesn't apply to Christians anyway. The important thing to know <clears throat> is that the concept of the priesthood means this. 
priests do for ordinary people what they cannot do for themselves. And what is that? They can't sacrifice on their own behalf. Only priests could do that. In biblical times, only the priests and Levites could sacrifice animals in the, in the temple. Today, only those priests in those churches which have priests as their clergy can perform the sacrifice of the Mass. In Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, no layperson is authorized to say the words or to take the symbolic actions which is believed to result in the bread and wine becoming the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. One of the main reasons that Protestants don't have priests is that Luther and Calvin taught the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. They vociferously and unalterably rejected the notion of the ordained clergy as priests. They said instead that every Christian is a priest to his or her neighbor. We're not priests for ourselves. We are priests for one another. In other words, we need community if we are to become connected to God. We can't do it on our own. That is the theological concept. <clears throat> However germane or otherwise all that may be to the subject of this sermon, the important thing to remember is this. The purpose of a priest is to build a bridge from a broken and sinful humanity to God. None of us can do that for himself or herself. We can only have it done for us. <clears throat> and so, says biblical tradition, we need priests. Well, as one century followed another in the history of ancient Israel, there emerged a figure known as the high priest. The high priest was elected by all the other priests, and he served for only a specific period of time. It was he, and he alone, who could perform the sacrifice in the small room in the very center of the temple in Jerusalem that was known as the Holy of Holies, in Latin, the Sanctum Sanctorum. The high priest performed this sacrifice only on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It was a great honor and a grave responsibility to be the high priest. There was only one high priest at a time. And as high priest, he performed only one unique sacrifice, and it occurred only on the highest of the high holy days. So then, do you see where the writer of the letter to the Hebrews is going when he calls Jesus the great high priest. He was not a great high priest. He was the great high priest. And he's that for all time, said the writer. There is no need for another high priest ever, said this Jewish writer writing to Jewish Christians, because Jesus is the great high priest. How can a mass murderer ever cross over the bridge from himself to God? How can the Russian officers who are ordering their men to shell apartment buildings and schools and churches ever make it across the bridge? How many of us whether we are Vladimir Putin's or Kim Jong-un's or St. Peter or Paul, Mary or Claire, how many of us can ever get from here to there? The answer is 
says the writer to the Hebrews, it is found in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the great high priest. Jesus builds a bridge for us. He bridges the gulf. He does that for us which we can never do for ourselves. He is the great high priest. He alone can take the step for which none of us can ever be connected to God. You need to recognize that certainly not all people or even all Christians believe this, but the writer to the letter of the writer of the letter to the Hebrews firmly believed it. Later he declared, Jesus has no need, like other high priests, to offer sacrifice daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he once did for all when he offered up himself. Jesus Christ, therefore, says the writer, is both the sacrificer and the sacrificed. He makes the sacrifice, but he also is the sacrifice, according to the letter to the Hebrews. The tradition of the church, which is echoed in this singular letter, is that Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross on our behalf. By dying, it is believed by many, Jesus gave us a new kind of life that transcends ordinary life. It may appear that historically the Church of Jesus Christ has emphasized too strongly the death of Jesus at the expense of his life. After all, fully one-third of all four Gospels is devoted to Holy Week and Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, while only two-thirds of his story of his remarkable life and his three-year ministry before Holy Week. It was not only by means of Jesus' death that he gave us new life. He also displayed for us the new life by how he lived and what he said and did. He turned common fishermen into giants of faith. He gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and health to the sick. He showed people who were spiritually dead how to come alive, and he bridged the gap between themselves and God. The bridge from us to God was in the course of being built in the foundations he laid through his life. And not only by Jesus' death and resurrection. We are going to die. That sober truth confronts us every now and then, but we try to put it out of our minds. Like Rosalind Carter or Norman Lear, or anyone else or everyone else, whether good or bad, or far more likely somewhere in between, we're all going to die. And no matter how good any of us is, There is not sufficient goodness for the gap between us and God to be bridged by our own efforts. We need a bridge builder, someone who knows who and what we are and who and what God is, and who is able somehow to get us from over here to over there. That someone may be perceived in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, the man with the outstretched arms welcoming everyone in. A lady once asked a philosopher, what do you think of the death penalty? After a few moments, the philosopher answered her, not much we can do about it. What do you mean, she asked. We're born with it, he said. Indeed, we are born with the death penalty. 
although it's not a penalty, but it is the natural conclusion to the life of everyone or everything that ever lived. Death is one of the few certainties in life. It is the inexorable visit which shall be made uh, on each of us by the so-called grim reaper. It isn't because of sin or because of Adam and Eve's fall from grace in the Garden of Eden. The death penalty comes because of life, because we live, because of the life penalty, not the death penalty. If we live, we shall die. It's the only way that life can end. But the seemingly infinite and eternal gulf between us and the one who made us has been bridged by the one who sent him. God did not create us with any possibility of losing any of us. We cannot close the gap, but God can, and he has once and for all And this is made clear by the bridge constructed by the great high priest. Christ Jesus entered the world in order that the world might know who God is, might know how deep and broad and high is the love of God. And that's the amazing part. Why does God love us like that? From what inexhaustible source does such love flow? How did God ever learn to be God? And why does he love everyone? That's the truly amazing part. Why does God love like that? From what inexhaustible source does such love flow? This week, we received a card and letter from a longtime friend. She came across a poem among her keepsakes, and she decided to share it with us. I was very grateful she did, and now I share it with you. It's called Surprise in Heaven. I dreamed death came the other night, and heaven's gate swung wide, An angel with a halo bright ushered me inside. And there, to my astonishment, stood folks I'd judged and labeled as quite unfit, of little worth, and spiritually disabled. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free. For every face showed stunned surprise. No one expected me. (laughs) If there is no great high priest, if none is able to bridge the gulf to get us to the other side, we're all lost. But we're not lost. We have a great high priest, the master bridge builder, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. To know him is to know him who sent him, and to know that one is to know all we need to know. It is to have the chasm bridged. It is to have the gap closed. No one can live without experiencing suffering to one degree or another. There was one among us who learned that more fully than anyone else. And he observed suffering in a variety of people. A Roman servant, a Roman centurion whose servant was gravely ill. A ruler of the synagogue whose daughter was near death. A mother whose son had died a Canaanite woman whose daughter was said to be demon-possessed, two sisters whose brother had been in the tomb four days. 
On the cross, Jesus endured unimaginable suffering himself. He had always felt obligated to do something to eliminate all human anguish. Therefore, he built a bridge to God for everyone in their own deep sorrow. The bridge is also there for us. Since, therefore, we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Amen. May grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and remain in your heart forever. Amen. Amen.